now that you've gotten your samples taken and sent off to whatever laboratory you like to use and have the results back, the real icing on the cake in this process is to take these numbers from the laboratory and turn it into crop response. And I'll start with the media analysis we have here of a good hydrangea plant. The first thing I kind of look at is the NPK levels, the major nutrient levels, which look fine here. The one thing that concerns me on this leaf analysis is that calcium and magnesium are essentially identical. So I like to see about an eight to one ratio of calcium to magnesium for most situations. Plants need six to eight times the amount of calcium that they do magnesium. And when you have less than a four to one ratio, you tend to have calcium problems. When you have more than a 10 to one ratio, you tend to have magnesium deficiency problems. And in fact, the ratio here is essentially one to one, it's identical between calcium and magnesium. And that in fact has led to some calcium deficiency in the leaf tissue. Calcium and magnesium are very similar chemically. And um, you basically want to have that proper ratio in order to avoid deficiency problems. So because that ratio is off the way it is, calcium is quite low in this leaf tissue. Um, the magnesium is borderline. Some agronomists and soil scientists don't believe in ratios at all. Uh, some people just totally reject that idea. Other consultants and agronomists I know totally focus in on ratio issues. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. If the ratio concept were worthless, it wouldn't have been around for 60 years. So I take sort of a middle of the road view in that I look at ratios but I also look at the, uh, you know, the overall basic numbers. These plants have plenty of fertilizer in the media. On the good hydrangeas, when you look at the leaf tissue, it's generally fine as well for the major nutrients. Calcium and magnesium are on the low side in the leaf tissue here. Another thing I like to look at is the iron to manganese ratio. I like to see pretty much a one-to-one -one iron to manganese ratio in both media analysis and in plant tissue. That's sort of the target or the ideal. When it gets more than two to one in either direction, you tend to have problems with whatever one is low. And I'll point out some examples of that in just a moment. There's another thing about iron in leaf tissue that you have to be aware of, and that is that you can't always count on the iron in a leaf analysis being available to the plant to manufacture chlorophyll. There are basically two valences or two types of iron in soil, and plants will take both of them up and if they're taking up the wrong kind of iron, you can have a good looking iron level in the leaf tissue and yet have a plant that is quite chlorotic, quite yellow. And I learned a long time ago that when I'm looking at an analysis of a chlorotic or yellow plant and I see that everything in the leaf analysis looks good, generally iron is your problem because iron is so touchy about whether it's really available or not. Um, again, I like to see about a one to one ratio of manganese to iron in the leaf tissue. In this good hydrangea, manganese is 172 and iron is 96. That's not quite two to one. In fact, the plants are fine. There are no iron or manganese issues here. The main thing that these plants need is additional calcium. And um, I would be recommending some foliar calcium. Um, Harold's has a really good glucoheptanate calcium source, or you could use a CalMag chelate here, which would have both calcium and magnesium in it. I would probably spray that several times. A few trace elements are slightly into the high range here, but they're not high enough for me to really be concerned about. It's not really an issue. High sulfur is almost never an issue either. People worry about high sulfur, but the truth is that elevated sulfur in plant tissue really doesn't cause problems most of the time. So what I see to sum up here in the good hydrangeas, I see a good looking media test. I see low calcium and magnesium in the leaf tissue and everything else basically looks fine. Turning now to the bad hydrangea. This was a comparison in the same greenhouse between good plants and bad plants. Basically, again, the major nutrients look fine here in the bad hydrangea test. The calcium is much better at 1.58. What I see here that attracts my attention is that manganese is 355 and iron is 123 parts per million. That's about a three to one ratio. And that's why these plants are off color. The manganese to iron ratio is beyond that two to one threshold. And iron is going to be the element that these plants will respond to. And in fact, I got an email from this grower about two days ago indicating that he had put the iron on and the plants are greening up. Other than that, these plants are very well fed. It's just that the iron manganese ratio is a bit off. 
Zinc is a little high. I suspect that might be from Mancozeb. Another thing I look at in leaf analyses is that when growers are spraying with diphthane or manzate, the ratio of manganese to zinc is about eight to one. So if I see roughly an eight to one ratio, I know it's probably from fungicide applications. So these plants will, and in fact are responding in the bad hydrangeas here to additional iron fertilizer. We also have some yellow hydrangeas here in this analysis. And the first thing that strikes me here is the nitrogen is very high. It's over 6%. If you think about it, that's more nitrogen than 666 fertilizer has on a dry basis. And I think what's going on here is these plants are getting pushed with a bit more nitrogen than they need, which is pushing a lot of luxurious growth. And the plant can't keep up with chlorophyll synthesis to make that growth green. Again, all of the trace elements are in the good to slightly high range here. I don't see a ratio problem between manganese and iron, but I think that again, these plants are gonna to respond to iron. What I would do here is reduce the fertility input a little bit to try to get a little lower nitrogen here and then increase the iron applications. Foliar iron generally works fine for most plants. Some plants that have thick or tough leaves, iron sprays don't work all that well. In a situation like that, you may do better with an iron drench or an iron top dress. But here again, on these hydrangeas, um, iron is what they are most likely to respond to. We have a Carex here as well next, which is an ornamental grass. It's a little more uh, of a temperate zone grass. What I see in this analysis, um, I see three things. I see low phosphorus and potassium. So I would probably be spraying 20-20-20 at two or three pounds per hundred gallons to try to improve that. You can also monopotassium phosphate as an alternative to increase the foliar um, phosphorus and potassium. The rest of the major and secondary nutrients look fine. What I see in the leaf analysis is a whole lot of manganese, almost 900 parts per million, which is a little scary. That's perhaps borderline toxic. Um, I see an iron of 271, so you've got about a, what's that, a three to one plus ratio there. Um, I would do a couple of things here. I would make sure that the soil pH is not low Manganese toxicity is often a function of low soil pH. Manganese is more available at low soil pH. I don't see anywhere near a ratio of eight to one in the manganese to zinc. So I suspect this set of plants has either gotten some foliar manganese recently or that the pH is low and they're taking up too much manganese. So what I would do here is make sure that the pH is not low on this crop. In fact, the pH was low. I believe it was 4.1. So I've recommended to the client to line them up to stop the excess manganese absorption. Uh, maybe spray a little iron on there to make sure they have adequate color. Although I took these samples myself and the color in the plants was, was pretty good. But you know, we don't want to get into a manganese toxicity situation. Well, other than that, um, the foliar nutrients really look fine. So we have phosphorus and potassium here and an excess of manganese and a wide manganese to iron ratio. I don't see anything else here that concerns me. So let's move on now to some, some water analyses. The things you want to be concerned about in water, the primary things are pH, alkalinity, and salt. You know, waters that have high pH tend to drive media pH up over time. What is alkalinity? Alkalinity is basically carbonates, bicarbonates, and hydroxyls. In most irrigation waters in this country, the uh, alkalinity primarily comes from bicarbonate. The carbonate doesn't exist in waters generally below a pH of 8. So if your water is pH 8 or below, like most people have, almost all of your uh, alkalinity is going to be in the form of bicarbonates. Once you're above pH 8, carbonates come into play. Carbonates and bicarbonates are not good for your trace element availability and actually carbonates and bicarbonates are toxic to roots to some extent. Um, the waters in these particular analyses are not all that high. Generally, you want 120 to 150 parts per million uh, bicarbonates in water and no more than that. These are just over 150, so they're really not anything much to worry about in these particular cases. So what you have here is waters with quite high pH, but relatively low alkalinity in the form of bicarbonates. And the, the truth is that alkalinity and high pH are not exactly the same thing. High pH is basically a lot of hydroxyls and no hydrogen in the water. 
whereas you know alkalinity is carbonates, bicarbonates, and hydroxyls. You can actually have 10 different waters with a pH of 8.0, but they can all have different levels of alkalinity in them. What do you do about highly alkaline water? Well, generally you acidify it. You inject uh, sulfuric acid or some other acidic product into the water to help knock the bicarbonates down. Um, these waters are not very hard at all. Um, what is hardness? Hardness is calcium and magnesium. That's it. It's calcium and magnesium. When you have hard water, what does a water softener do? It exchanges the calcium and magnesium with sodium. And that's how water is softened. Basically, you're replacing the hardness with salt. These waters have very low salinity. You normally start to worry about sodium and chloride above 70 parts per million. And generally, by the time you approach 300, bad things are starting to happen. Now, know that some plants are a lot more salt tolerant than others. So exactly what the critical level is will depend on the plant. But basically, you're fine as long as you're below 70 parts per million sodium and 70 parts per million chloride. Once you get up around 100 and higher, then I start squirming in my seat a little bit, depending on what kind of plants we have here. Electrical conductivity, which is the second number here after the pH. Let me explain conductivity to you this way. If I put somebody in a bathtub in absolutely pure water, and I put a billion volts on the end of that bathtub, the person in the tub won't be electrocuted because absolutely pure water does not conduct electricity. Once you start adding salts and ions into the water, now the water conducts electricity. And the ratio of conductance is directly proportional to the amount of ions in that water. As you start throwing fertilizer salts or sodium and chloride or whatever kind of salts you might have into that bathtub, the conductivity increases. Generally, uh, the conductivity times 640 gives you total dissolved solids. What that basically tells you is how many ions in general are dissolved in that water. And generally the total dissolved solids number should add up roughly to the total sum of all the numbers you have here. It's an estimate, so it's not, it doesn't line up perfectly, but the total dissolved solids should roughly equal the sum of all the nutrient levels here. Sometimes iron can be a problem in irrigation water, in alkaline waters, in terms of staining. If you go to a place, say in the mountains where the water is acidic, uh, the staining is not going to be a factor. But when you have water with above 0.07 parts per million iron and the water is alkaline, you can start to get staining. The water comes out as iron hydroxide, which then turns to iron oxide, which is rust. And you get rust all over your irrigated surfaces, your plants, your ground cover or whatever. These waters have very low, uh, Iron numbers, they're about 0 0.02, 0 0.01. There's, there's really no iron here to be concerned about. So these waters basically I would characterize as being high in pH, pretty reasonable in terms of bicarbonates, very low in salts, very low in iron, and very low in hardness. Overall, these are pretty good waters for irrigating plants other than the pH. If you have a lot of calcium and bicarbonates in your water at the same time, you can get a lot of calcium staining on leaf surfaces. And sometimes people like to inject acid just to keep that white film off of the, the leaf tissue, have a nice shiny leaf that's uh, taken care of from there. Some parts of the country have elevated boron in the irrigation water. That's a difficult thing to deal with. Uh, if you have high boron in irrigation water around the country, basically you want to just reduce or eliminate the boron input in your fertilizer program. Realize that boron is the only trace element that leaches so one thing you can do is avoid frequent light irrigations and instead water less often but for longer duration in order to help boron flush through the soil profile. You do the same thing with salty water. If your water is running a little salty, if you water a little less often but longer, you can flush more salt through the soil profile and deal with a higher level of salinity that way. So that's our little uh, treatise and lesson for today on how to interpret uh, soil plant tissue and water analysis. Thanks very much for tuning in.